Hello everyone, we're just getting started. Good morning everyone, good afternoon, good evening to you from all around the world. We're just getting started and I'll leave it a minute so that people can join us. I'll wait for a minute to see people joining us. I see people coming into the our virtual room. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our panel today. Um, we're just uh, allowing people into the room. I think we'll start. Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone from all around the world. Welcome to our panel on, uh, sorry, I just was something up. No, it's fine. Uh, welcome to our panel today on Women Political Leaders, the Evidence of the Impact of Gender on Democracy. My name is Sophia Fernandez and I'm Senior Advisor Political Inclusion at the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. Um, today's panel will be translated into Arabic. We're just setting up that um, functioning, but soon you'll hopefully see um, a, a translation sign at the bottom of the screen where we'll be able to make that function available. Um, but we're, we're just arranging that at the moment. Um, so do keep out for that and I will remind everyone as we go through. Um, we will have time at the end of the session for question and answers uh, and so I ask you to please join us in the conversation via your chat function. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. We are also live on Facebook and my colleagues will be sharing that link in the chat, chat function as well to share with any others and we invite you to join us on Twitter uh, at WFD underscore democracy hashtag women leading. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, WFD, we're an arm's length body of the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and we've, we've been working for over the last nearly 30 years across the globe on democratic and institutional strengthening with parliaments, with political parties, civil society and election processes. And I welcome you all to join us today and especially our distinguished panellists to discuss with us this very important topic. At WFD, we've been just working and designing uh, development programs with politically active women, uh, women candidates, uh, women political party members, and women's rights organizations to facilitate women's political leadership, acknowledging that women often exercise political leadership without the formal title that is associated, without all the formal trappings, and, and acknowledging that there are many, many barriers to women's formal leadership around the world. Uh, last year, we partnered uh, with the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College London uh, to produce a literature review that looked at the impact of women in formal political spaces. You know, how have they changed the face of international relations and politics? Um, and we looked at this over the last 25 years to coincide with Beijing plus 25. 
Uh, you will find uh, the report uh, that we produced in our, uh, with some links in the chat box that's available in both English and Arabic, and we'll be covering that today. Uh, also today we've launched the first paper in a two-part series that we've been looking at specifically women's political careers, you know, how they enter politics and how their careers are sustained, which you can also find on our website. Uh, so our panellists, um, in the interest of time, I won't go through full bios, but we will put a link in our chat box there for the full biographies, but I will quickly introduce each of our panellists today. Um, I welcome Dr. Mina Kapokols, the re lead researcher of the paper, um, who will present some of our main findings, which really shows the evidence, um, as I mentioned before, uh, that business case for why women really do need to be uh, leading and why we need to facilitate that leadership. Uh, following that, we have a fantastic panel of women politicians who will be joining us and talking about their own experience against some of these findings, particularly on prioritising equality legislation, um, how they've had to challenge their own political parties to achieve their roles, um, and on their own resilience. Um, so it's my pleasure to also welcome from the UK, the Right Honourable Maria Miller, the former Minister for Women and Equalities and current co-chair of the APPG on Women. Uh, Preet Kaur Gill, who will be joining us shortly, uh, Shadow Secretary of State for International Development. Uh, from Iraq, I welcome MP Intisar Jibouri, who's a founding member of the Coalition of Arab Women MPs to Combat Violence Against Women and Girls. From Malawi, I welcome Honourable Liana Chipota MP, who became a Member of Parliament in 2019. And from South Africa, a very much warm welcome to Sibiwe Gwarube MP, who is the Shadow Minister for Health. You're all very, very welcome. Today we'll have a chance to go to, to invite each panellist to speak, and then my colleague Shannon O'Connell, the Director of Programs at WFD, will take us through a moderated question and answer and discussion. Um, I'm going to try to be a little bit strict with timekeeping, as we would like to have that opportunity for discussion, uh, so please, panellists, do excuse me if I interrupt you and give you a minute warning. Uh, and so I turn to you, Mina, uh, really for the opportunity to, to talk through the research. I'm, I'm ready to launch into it and, and share all those findings, but I know you'll be doing that very ably for us. So I'll hand over to you and I know you've got a PowerPoint as well. Yes. Um, just sharing my screen, I hope that comes up. Um, okay, That's yes, working. thank you very much, um, Sophia and uh, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy for asking me to speak. Um, and hello and ahlan wa sahlan to all the attendees and um, to the panelists. I'm really honoured to be speaking amongst so many um, distinguished people um, and real live uh, women political leaders from across the globe. Um, I really look forward to hearing from them all, um, particularly because I've done all this research on the paperwork and so it's wonderful to hear their lived experiences of, of being a woman in politics. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about how to get more women into politics but also the impact that they have uh, when they get there. Women currently make up only 25.6% of MPs worldwide. Um, that means that globally we have a long way to go if you believe, as I do, um, that the parity of political presence between women and men is fundamental for representative, legitimate and accountable democratic systems. I'm going to be drawing on uh, the findings from the report that um, I wrote with some colleagues um, women Political Leaders, The Impact of Gender on Democracy, um, which I wrote for the Global Institute of Women's Leadership and the Westminster Foundation of Democracy. Uh, this report really demonstrates a need for more women in politics. It's not just that it's the right thing to do, um, but it's also because when their voices are included in politics, um, democracy and policy and policy making begin to shift. And this is all the more interesting because that the women who do get to, into power are usually working within very male dominated systems. They tend to be governed by their own party, their own party's politics and manifestos and through male dominated power structures and institutions. And in order to survive, women um, in politics often have to play the game. Yet despite this, research has shown in hundreds of different studies across uh, party and national lines that incrementally through a few more schools here, better sanitation there, a few more hours working on constituency matters in between, that, that, that when there are more women in politics, they help to create more inclusive, caring and equal societies. So today I'm going to look at very briefly um, the impact of, that women have on democracy itself, um, the impact um, that women are having on policy, and, um, and then I'm going to look at some of the obstacles 
um, and ways to overcome them. Um, so the general question of how to increase the number of women in politics. Um, I hope that this introduction provokes some interesting discussions about, um, about what you have found to help and, and your own experiences. And so very, very briefly um, to go into the methods, I, um, I looked at, I sort of gathered over a thousand pieces of um, research. Out of those, I found 500 that fit my criteria of um, dating between 1995 and 2020. I was only looking at English, um, which obviously is a bit restrictive. I was looking for original research mostly. There are a few theoretical pieces that I included. And I was doing some broad searches across library catalogues, Google Scholar um, and from JSTOR. But as well as that, I was looking at um, organizations and NGOs um, around the world which might be conducting their own research on these kinds of sub subjects. So I think what's missing is um, some foreign language research and any other pieces which didn't get picked up by my research criteria. <coughs> but that's, sorry, a bit geeky um, <laughs> overview there. So first to look at the impact of women in politics on democracy. So women political leaders seem to, to do democracy a bit differently to men and having more women in politics improves the quality of democracy. Increasing the proportion of women makes democracy more inclusive but also seems to mean less corruption. So on this first point, there is the, the important argument that having more women in politics bolsters democracy in and of itself. And what I mean that is that if democracies are meant to be representative and accountable, they should not be representing and accounting to only half the population. Um, further, the research shows that women prioritize uh, their constituency roles more than men. This has been found in lots of different cases. Um, and that women work harder than men at responding to their constituents. This shows that women put more emphasis upon their representative roles and they're more connected and responsive to their local areas. Um, there's also some evidence that women are more inclusive and cooperative in their leadership styles. This is again a bit more anecdotal, but some studies have found that women leaders tend to be more likely to consult with community groups before making decisions. But other studies pointed to female leaders dismantling some of the more hierarchical um, aspects of their positions. Finally, and importantly, um, women have also reframed what is considered political. So that means bringing into politics issues such as domestic violence, female genital mutilation, childcare, maternity policies, and bring that all into the political sphere, stuff that used to be considered private matters. These findings show that women help to bring more people and policies into the democratic process. I'd argue that this greater inclusion in itself improves democracy. Second, there is this astonishing finding that women in politics are linked to lower levels of corruption. And this finding stands for both petty crimes and collusion and at all levels of government and in many, many different cultural contexts. And the reasoning behind this re remarkable finding is partly that women as individuals are found to be less corrupt, but there's also likely an effect that women leaders um, they're either indicating or they're causing a breakup of some of the patronage networks and old boys clubs, which are the backbone of corrupt practices. Um, as we can see, the increase of women in politics has worked to improve democracies by making them cleaner and more inclusive. But just to be clear, I'm not trying to argue that women need to justify their presence in politics by being more moral or more inclusive than men, nor do I want to reinforce gender stereotypes. But I think it is important to show that the evidence suggests that including women may bring about a different way of doing things. So a quick look at the impact of more women leaders on policy. So there are two main findings here. First, that women in politics prioritize women's issues. Um, and by this, I mean mostly that policy areas that are seen to benefit women mostly, such as equal rights, reproductive rights, um, and sexual health, um, families and childcare, and stopping violence against women. The second finding is that women also prioritize a number of issues which benefit both men and women, especially if these policies tend to fall within the remit of care. I'm taking that quite broadly, but from that, I mean, from education to welfare to healthcare, or particularly in India and Africa, the provision of clean water and good sanitation. But this sort of broad trend extends into the international sphere where women leaders more than men tend to prioritize aid over military spending. And these, these gender differences in priorities have real world impacts. Studies in Canada, Switzerland, and India 
have shown that having more women political leaders, so in regions where there are women, uh, more women leaders, can mean um, higher education levels, better sanitation um, and health, and increased life expectancy on the ground. Also findings suggest that um, states with more women legislators are less likely to commit human rights abuses, such as torture, and are more likely to have longer periods of peace and less conflict. So these last two slides show the importance of having women in politics and women as leaders. Again, my point is not that women deserve to be included because they are more caring or um, the fact that women have these different priorities, but the fact that women have these different priorities highlights the importance of including women in of people in politics with different life experiences. The reasoning goes beyond the argument that there should be more women simply because of the reason of equality, but also shows us what we're missing when women are, as they are, um, and they continue to be, severely underrepresented. Okay, um, although my research, my report wasn't meant to be looking at the obstacles um, to women entering politics, um, we found there was a huge amount of research on the obstacles to women's polit political participation. So to start with, um, it's worth looking at what is described as the supply and the demand um, side of entry into politics. Women are often blamed for their underrepresentation because women are less likely to be interested in politics or to put themselves forward as candidates. We also see, however, a lack of uh, demand um, from political parties for women candidates too, which might be seen as institutionalized bias against women. Parties and selection committees may have preformed ideas of what a good candidate looks like, which may disadvantage women. This bias may continue throughout women's political careers. Another example of this bias, which we see in many countries, is that at ministerial level, women continue to be less likely to, given, to be given what are seen as the harder or the more important positions, such as um, being in charge of the economy, the military um, or foreign affairs. One interesting finding on this level is that women are, um, are less likely to be given Ministry of Defence roles if a state is um, at war or in, involved in a conflict, but um, they're more, they might be more likely to get a Ministry of Defence role um, if the military has become more associated with peacekeeping. So you can see this kind of stereotyping and nuance going through the whole um, area. Uh, so to carry on, um, women are often excluded from many male networks and networking opportunities, um, and this can severely disadvantage them. Um, particularly when candidate selection is more informal or where they're less able to build relationships with powerful groups of supporters. So examples of this are when, for example, uh, male socialising happens in, in bars or clubs after hours where women might feel uncomfortable or might be, be less able to attend. Um, or else perhaps um, you might see that power networks coincide with tribal or religious groupings. And examples of that I've found in the literature about Jordan and Lebanon. Other obstacles um, for women include the high financial costs of campaigns. And this hits women harder because women tend to be poor and have less access to resources. Um, and then there's a big issue of cultural attitudes about women. In many countries, strongly misogynistic views about women's abilities um, or their roles can can limit their potential for success. This presents a serious barrier for women um, to, ent to enter into politics. In many cases, women who enter politics may face attacks on their morality or their reputation. And this has been found in studies from the US to Papua New Guinea. So it's not a developing world problem or a Western problem. It's a, a global issue. Um, and this can impact both the supply of women willing to enter politics, but it can also impact the demand for women uh, uh, from political parties who might not want to have a woman if they're seen as a less um, able leader. And these negative cultural attitudes can often be amplified and uh, by, the, by the national media or media coverage. Okay, next about care responsibility. We know that women tend to take on the majority of care responsibility worldwide. And therefore, when political careers and political institutions fail to accommodate that, women are disproportionately excluded. Um, in addition to this, and on the sort of the flip side, uh, women without children can be viewed by the public or by the media with suspicion. So 
I think uh, Julia Gillard faced this quite a lot. She doesn't have um, children, but she was seen as sort of being a bit odd for that um, and faced a lot of hostility on that front. And finally, but importantly, women in politics um, are targeted with violence and threats to a much greater degree than men. And this can put them off entering politics or it can cause them to leave politics. And in my studies, this range from threats of violence and rape on social media through to crotch grabbing by follow, fellow parliamentarians and forced virginity testing. One study of female officials in the Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Honduras, Tanzania and Tunisia found that 55% had been subjected to violence while performing their duties. So the pyramid on the right here is from a book by uh, Johnny Lavandusky and it provides a diagram to show the many stages in the ladder of political recruitment. Um, it just uh, it indicates a number of points at which women may fall away or where positive measures might be introduced. I think it's just quite a good visual tool for um, understanding the, the path into politics. So research um, shows that historically these obstacles mean that women, that the only women who've been able to reach power have been, been able to do so because of having um, some other opportunity or advantage. So the two main categories I found was that elite women were more able to enter politics through their family networks, they had wealth, etc. So they could tackle a few of these um, problems. The other, the other sort of point at which women might enter would be at times of crisis. Um, so um, you look at the settlements in the post-genocide Rwanda or post-apartheid South Africa, that's often been a, a, a point at which women have been able to capitalize on the change and the crisis points and being able to then um, build a greater role for them in the future. But obviously we don't want to rely on times of stress <laughs> uh, or having a elite background as our solutions going forward. So I'm going to quickly look at some of the other um, ways that we can overcome the obstacles for women to enter politics. Okay, I've slightly falsely um, grouped <laughs> A group star solutions into women can and reform can um, but by women I mean not just all women but also women within political parties um, or in women's organizations outside so I'm just trying to simplify it with the slides a bit so first to overcome the lack of women putting themselves forward the literature suggests that motivation promotion and training might offer a solution this is, the training is often not because women actually lack the skills, but they may lack the self-belief or being asked. <laughs> so it's, it's part of the process of sort of um, preparing women almost psychologically more than um, in terms of their skill set. A further way to help women is by becoming role models. Um, so the role model effect um, is where research shows that women who women are more likely to show interest in and enter politics when there are female, a prominent female role models. Um, an example is the Julia Gillard effect in Australia, which has been researched, and it shows that in the data um, from 2010, women and men's um, interest in politics and knowledge of politics is equal. And then after she leaves office, it reverts back down to uh, men having greater interest in politics. So you can see these, the, these effects do um, make a difference and who is visible does make a difference um, right at the ground level. Um, further, women's caucuses, uh, women's parliamentary bodies, um, etc., can be really helpful. They not only help um, make women politicians more likely to legislate for women, but they can also provide networking sites for women and a support base for those seeking higher office. Um, also, we can see sometimes with both of these, we can see a spillover effect where when there are more women in the legislature and perhaps with these parliamentary bodies, etc., as well, and women are then more likely to enter the cabinet. Um, so you can start seeing virtuous circles forming. Um, so if women are excluded from male networks, then we should create women's networks or use other networks which are already available. So women's groups, caucuses and organisations can connect, um, can set up women's networks and events to help women connect with supporters, allies and funders. <laughs> Uh, these may be within political parties, training centres, NGOs, or more informal. Um, in some of the case studies I looked at, um, such as in uh, Indonesia and Zimbabwe, scholars described the importance for women of, of the uh, networks and experience that they gained through organising within religious organisations as well. 
um, next to combat women's uh, lack of financial uh, access, um, there are funds that have been set up which are which target women candidates and help them, um, such as um, Emily's List in the US and Australia, and also Wish in the, in the US, which raise money particularly for um, female candidates. Um, the research also shows, and I've I've been looking uh, this particular piece of research looking at the local level in India, that where there have been women leaders, women are more likely to be elected again. And it's, again, we see this virtuous circle forming. Um, so that's even when women have been put in place through a quota system, then women are more likely to be voted in afterwards. Um, the studies also show that women are more likely to become leaders in more feminized societies. So again, that the role of culture and the role of women's leadership kind of becomes a circle there. Um, there's a piece of research also by Annas Lee et al. Uh, in 2019 that shows that once a woman has been appointed to a cabinet position, it then becomes a sort of concrete floor at the cabinet level that future cabinets shouldn't then drop below this kind of single female <laughs> mark. So the, the point is that as each woman sort of uh, enters, in, enters, enters into politics and becomes a leader, they help to smooth the path for other women by changing attitudes. Mina, I'm going to interrupt and just give you the one minute call, please. Oh, OK, I'll zoom through. Sorry, I've been, I normally speak too fast. But obviously, I'm speaking slowly. No, no. Okay, so quickly to go through the reforms. The important ones, it's quotas. Then we have electoral reform. Um, so in terms of electoral reform, um, uh, proportional representation is the, the best, <laughs> but obviously it's quite difficult to do. Formalising candidate selection processes is really important um, because the more informal it is, the more men's networks send to Trump. Uh, introducing term limits stops in incumbents holding onto the positions targeting corruption, um, and then regulating ca campaign funding. So it's equal for men and women, and um, it's placing a cap on it so that you can't buy um, better campaigns. And something else that can be done is you can get governments to um, ensure fair media coverage for both male and female candidates. And um, a very important one is trying to get from the ground up um, accommodation for caring responsibilities. So bringing in childcare provision, maternity leave, et cetera. And a final very, very important one, but one which I haven't yet found a solution for, or there isn't clear legislation, is trying to work to stop the violence directed against women politicians. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I won't do my summary at the end, but I hope that's given you a good overview. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina. That's that's excellent. I mean, I've been working with these findings for some time now, and we WFD have been adjusting our, our programming to try to meet some of these findings and amplify some of the ways to address some of these barriers. Um, I'd like to invite our, our first uh, parliamentarian, uh, Maria Miller from the UK, to speak to that point, Maria, uh, Mina, that you made that, you, you know, what we're missing out when women don't have a place in, in leadership is the legislation and policy priorities that they bring to the political sphere. Um, and I think, Maria, you've got a very interesting story to tell about your experiences, both as a former minister for women and equalities in the UK, but also your time uh, in, in Parliament and your prioritisation of this work. So I'll hand over the floor to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And it's a huge pleasure to be able to speak at this event today. And the report that we've just been taken through really shows the importance of having more women in leadership positions. And um, the report identifies women policymakers as creating more equal societies and bringing collaborative and inclusive leadership. Um, all good things that we would all want to see in our countries. Um, but women in political leadership uh, is still the exception and not the rule. So before we consider ways that we can positively impact on democracy, I just wanted to draw on my experience from having worked in 20 years in business before becoming an MP, uh, because becoming an MP was for me very much a second career. Um, and I think we've come a long way in, in understanding the roles and the important roles that women can have. Um, the way we think, the way we solve problems and the way we act towards each other is based on our life experience and the challenges we've had. And if we work in a group of people who have all the same experiences, come from the same schools, the same universities, then the chances are when they respond to a challenge, they'll respond in the same way. 
So it's not surprising that now the wisdom in business um, is that diversity is absolutely crucial. And McKinsey's report uh, validated that uh, in terms of profits too. And we know that, um, and I think this is what I felt when I came into Parliament, that women's experiences were so very different from men's because gender stereotyping is unfortunately still writ large, bias in our educational system, uh, taking time to have children, sexual harassment. These are all things that as a woman I had experienced firsthand, whereas my male counterparts simply hadn't. Um, so we are still to see um, more women in political leadership and it still lags behind men. Um, and, and I think I was very interested in why that was the case. And it's something that I looked at when I chaired the Women and Equality Select Committee. And I was once told by a party leader who truly felt and he understood the importance of female leadership, who said to me that his party had done all it could to attract women, but women simply didn't want to stand for election, that they couldn't force women to stand for election in their party. And if you read that report, you'll see who said it. I, I won't comment. Um, the truth is that none of us want to be set up to fail. So we don't apply for jobs we don't think we'll get. And we won't apply for jobs where we think there's a chance we won't get to the top or we might even fail. We'll use our energy and talents elsewhere. There's no shortage of female leadership, certainly not in my country, but until parties and parliament around the world become places women feel they will succeed and make a difference, we will still see a shortage of female talent in the pipeline. Now, my own experience in parliament has been uh, over 15 years and I have seen truly groundbreaking legislation brought in by people like Theresa May, uh, who was our formidable prime minister, who spearheaded massive reforms to domestic abuse laws and has also led the world in terms of modern day slavery legislation. And it's clear to me that as a female member of parliament, um, I can make a real difference because my experience of the world and my views of the challenges are not the same as my male counterparts. And the challenge is how to bring all of those experiences together in a systemic way that will change things better for the long term. And that's why one of the things that I called for as a member of parliament was the establishment of a committee devoted only to looking at scrutinizing the issue of equality. And we've embedded, embedded that into our parliament as a select committee. And I was privileged to chair that committee and its work for five years. Um, I'm also campaigning to reform the House of Commons because its working practices are more rooted in the 18th century than the 21st century. And if we're going to attract more people from a diverse cross section, including women, then that's not good enough and we have to change. As political female leaders, uh, we, we need to ensure we don't shy away from confronting things that are traditionally seen outside of the norm. Um, and I see it as an absolute virtue that we do democracy different. Um, having chaired three inquiries on sexual harassment, something which had never been talked about in Parliament before, um, I have been able to demonstrate that the outpourings of grief uh, that we saw following the murder of a young woman in London very recently are as rooted in women's everyday experiences of sexual harassment um, as anything else. And we must not dismiss those issues simply because traditionally they have been dismissed as being trivial or unimportant, unimportant. And I am now campaigning for changes in the law to provide protection for, for women online um, who often experience um, image-based, sorry, that's my uh, battery going, sorry, real-time alert, I'm having a power cut, so that's uh, having to go onto a battery, I'm sorry. Um, 
so um, uh, another area which I uh, has, has, has received very little attention in the UK Parliament is are the challenges that women experience when they're in the workplace. And I have a series of measures I'd like to see adopted in the UK, particularly in support of pregnant women, uh, because a piece of research that the government did uh, themselves has identified that in our country, 50,000 women a year leave their jobs simply because they're pregnant, despite some of the best pregnancy protection in the world. Um, it, it is my job, I think, to make sure that we have laws that actually work in practice for women, not just in theory as part of legislation. Um, and within my own party, to try and address some of the issues that were in the presentation we've just seen, I've worked with others to establish a women's network which meets regularly to provide support to new members, but can also act as a fulcrum for issues that need to be addressed more widely. Um, it's really clear to me that we're starting to better identify the cultural uh, challenges uh, that are faced, not just in the UK, but around the world, in encouraging more women to take on leadership positions in politics. Uh, we need to understand that better. We need to encourage more women to come forward. And we've got enormous opportunities in the coming year in the UK around uh, our leadership of the G7 and COP26 to showcase women's leadership on the global stage promoting gender equality um, and particularly uh, tackling the issues that are most pertinent to women's lives, particularly around uh, violence against women. And I'm urging my government to be ratifying the ILO Convention on Violence and Harassment in the workplace as a way of drawing that attention to uh, that issue to the attention of the world in this important year. More women leading our democracies is clearly an essential part of creating stronger and fairer societies. And it's an absolute duty on all of us that we champion the role of women so that we can pass on to younger generations a much better society, which is fairer and more equal for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. And I did get warning about your power cut, so it's even more remarkable to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. In case you do drop off, we we might get some questions later that we can we can send your way. But we welcome you staying on for the rest of our panel. Um, I, I would like to, to just let everyone know that the interpretation function is now available. Apologies for that at the start. Um, and if you go toward the bottom of your screen, you should see a little interpretation symbol um, and be able to click on the relevant language there, Arabic or English. Um, I'd next like to invite um, from Iraq, Intisar al Jabouri, who's an MP in, in Iraq and one of the founding members of the coalition um, against violence against women uh, in Arab countries. Um, Intisa has been a champion for women's and girls' rights, especially champions, championing legislation against domestic and gender-based violence. Um, I hand over to you and Intisa to tell us a little bit more about your efforts. وشكرا لدعوتي للمشاركة في برنامجكم وعرضكم هذا أنا النائبة انتصار الجبوري عن محافظة نينوى قضو البرلمان العراقي نائبة رئيسة لجنة المرأة والمسرة والطفولة فيه قضوة للبرلمان لثلاث دورات وأنا أضو مؤسس لإتلاف البرلمانيات من الدول العربية لمناغمة الحنوبة المرأة ومسؤولة المحور التشريعي فيه وأمينة السر الاتلاف عضو الهيئة الإدارية لشبكة النخبة للتنمية أقدم شكر الجزيل لمؤسسة ويست مينستر والقائمين على اجتماع لجنة وضع المرأة أسمحوا لي أن أقدم عرضا موجزا لما أنجزته وأنجزته لجنة المرأة والأسرة والطفولة في البرلمان العراقي بشأن قانون مناهضة العنف ضد المرأة مراحل التشريع 
في 2017 15 في الشهر الواحد احالت لج... هيئه الرئاسه برلمان العراق الى لجنه المراه قانون مناهضه العنف بالاسري عملنا على تشريعه بلجان مساندة لنا هي لجنة حقوق الإنسان واللجنة القانونية وكان هيئة الرئاسة داعمة لهذا القانون وقرئ قراءة أولى ونحن في مراحل تشريع القوانين يقرأ القانون قراءة أولى ثم تبدأ نقاشاته مع منظمات مجتمع المدني والأكاديميين والمختصين وعرض كافة القانون وتفاصيله ثم تبدأ القراءة الثانية قرئ القانون قراءة أولى بالشهر الثالث آذار من 2015 وقرئ قراءة ثانية في يعني الفترات السابقة في الشهر الخامس تعاونت معنا مؤسسة ويست مينستر مع لجنة المرأة ونظمت عدة ورشات عمل مع المعهد العربي للتدريب البرلماني وكذلك ورشة تدريبية لعدد من عضوات اللجنة حول مشروع قانون الحماية من العنف الأسري كما عقدنا وضمنا لجنة مبادرة قرار مجلس الأمن 1325 اجتماعات دورية مع منظمات المجتمع المدني وتناول الاجتماع والمناقشات حول مشروع قانون الحماية من العنف الأسري وفي الشهر الثامن عقدت الجلسة الملتقى التشريعي لمناقشة القانون الحماية من العنف الأسري بمشاركة هيئة الأمم المتحدة وحضور منظمات مجتمع المدني وخبراء في القانون لغرض التوصل إلى صيغة مشتركة في القانون استضافت لجنة المرأة كثير من الشخصيات المهمة المسؤولة عن تنفيذ القانون وعن العقبات والتحديات التي تواجه هذه الجهات اثناء تطبيق القانون منها وزارة الداخلية وزارة العمل وزارة العدل مجلس القضاء الاعلى ولكن بصراحة قراءة قرآنية في نهاية سنة 2017 أتينا للتصويت لكننا لم نستطع التصويت عليه لكون في سنة 2018 هناك من بدأت الأصوات تصرخ وخصوصا الأحزاب الإسلامية بأن هذا القانون مخالف للشريعة الإسلامية ونحن في الدستور لدينا مادة يمنع تشريع قانون مخالف لثوابت الشريعة الإسلامية طبعا كان السبب غير صحيح لكون هذا القانون مناهض هو ليس مناهض كنا قد اجتمعنا مع المرجعية الدينية في النجف وفي كربلاء المقدسة وكذلك التقينا بمسؤولين في الوقف السني والوقف الشيعي وأكدوا أن هذا القانون هو مطابق لما تتطلبه الشريعة الإسلامية من تعليمات و يعني نبذ العنف ضد المراه والتعامل مع بالمراه والاسره بلين ورفق وليس بعنف ولا ضرب. حقيقه اتت الدوره الاخيره دوره 2018 هذه الدوره البرلمانيه وعملنا في لجنه المراه حول هذا القانون لكن للاسف رئاسة الوزراء رئيس الوزراء الجديد قال أريد القوانين التي لم تشرع في الدورات السابقة كي أنظمها وأدخلها في البرنامج الحكومي أرسل القانون من ضمن القوانين إلى مجلس الوزراء ثم إلى مجلس الدولة لدينا مجلس الدولة هو القانون هي الجهة التي تدقق القانون القوانين هل هي معارضة مع الدستور هل هي معارضة مع قوانين أخرى بالتالي عمل مجلس الدولة وأرسله وقال إنه مطابق للقانون للشريعة وللدستور ولكل متطلبات الحياة الاجتماعية في المجتمع العراقي أرسل إلى مجلس الوزراء ثم أرسل إلى مجلس النواب كذلك هناك نسخة أخرى من رئاسة الجمهورية أرسلت إلى مجلس النواب لكن للأسف الشديد لحد الآن النسخ لم ترسل إلى لجنة المرأة لنتمكن من القراءة الأولى والقراءة الثانية ومن ثم التصويت عليه لدينا معارضين جدا حول هذا القانون وخصوصا الأحزاب <تصفيق> عفوا التي تدعي وتقول إن, مخ... إن هذا القانون مخالف 
ظهرت بيانات كثيرة ضد القانون ظهرت أصوات تدعو إلى إلى رفضه من حيث المبدأ هيئة الرئاسة خشت أن يرفض من حيث المبدأ ويعاد من الصفر الآن في الوقت الحاضر نمضي إلى إلى قراءة قراءة أولى <تصفيق> عذرا اسفه نمضي الى الضغط حول على رئاسه البرلمان لارسال هذا القانون الى لجنه المراه، حقيقه كانت لدينا مقابله مع السيد رئيس الوزراء وكان لدينا مقابله مع السيد رئيس الجمهوريه وكلاهما اكدا انهما داعمين للقانون وداعمين لتشريعه وتوفير البيئة المناسبة لهذا القانون ولتطبيقه هيئة الرئاسة أيضا هي داعمة لهذا الموضوع لكنها تخشى من الأصوات التي سترفض هذا القانون من حيث إعادته إلى, إلى رئاسة الوزراء كي يعاد يعني التأخير خشية من أن يعاد إلى رئاسة الوزراء نعمل الآن على الضغط على هيئة الرئاسة كي ترسل القانون ونقرأه قراءة أولى وثانية ومن ثم التصويت عليه في مجلس النواب العراقي يعني الوضع في العراق وخصوصا في جائحة كورونا حقيقة مزري للغاية وحالات ازدادت حالات العنف سيما في أثناء الحظر حظر التجوال وهذا الحظر أثر على ذوي الدخل المحدود مما أدى إلى جلوس الرجال في البيت وفي داخل البيوت وزيادة حالات العنف ضد المرأة في هذه الفترة بالتالي زادت حالات الانتحار زادت حالات القتل قتل النساء قتل الأطفال قبل فترة يعني قامت إحدى الزوجات إحدى الأمهات برمي أطفالها في نهر دجلة وعند السؤال والتحقيق معها مع ذويها كان ومعها ومع زوجها لماذا اقدمت على رمي اطفالها في دجله في نهر دجله قالوا يعني توصلنا الى ان هذه بسبب حالات العنف في الاسره. المهم نحن نحتاج الى دعم ويستمنستر لتشريع هذا القانون، نحتاج الى دعم الامم المتحده، نحتاج دعم منظمات مجتمع مدني لاستمرار عملنا في القانون. كذلك عملت انا على الغاء الماده 398 للاسف انا اقول ان قانون العقوبات العراقي رقم 111 لسنه 69 فيه تكريس كامل للعنف فيه حالات من المواد القانونيه التي تكرس العنف ضد المراه منها الماده 398 التي التي تعفي مرتكب جريمه اغتصاب المراه من العقوبة في حالة عرض الزواج عليها حتى يعفى المرتكب الفعل من العقوبة وعلى أن تعيش معه لمدة ثلاث سنوات فهي تواجه حالتين أولا حالة الاغتصاب التي تعد جريمة خطرة في بشعة تذهب ضحيتها المرأة هذا هذه جريمة الجريمة الثانية هي هي النتيجة لهذه حالات الاغتصاب فهي أما تقتل بسبب العادات والتقاليد التي الموجودة في العراق أو تتزوج من مغتصبها كي يعفى هو من العقوبة ومن معاقبتها ضمن قانون العقوبات العراقي هذه جريمة ترتكب على المرأة مرتين مرة بالاغتصاب ومرة بأن تعيش لدى الزوج حتى لدى المقتصب حتى يعفى هو وهذه يعني حقيقة جريمة ضد الإنسانية ترتكب ضد المرأة العراقية جمعت في الدورة الثانية 66 توقيع لغرض إلغاء هذه المادة من قانون العقوبات حتى تأخذ المقتصب العقوبة الكاملة ويزجن حاله حال ال يعني مرتكب الجريمه بدون تخفيف او بدون اعفاء من هذه الجريمه في حال الزواج، لانها اذا رفضت اما تقتل او تتزوج او او تنبذ من المجتمع العراقي علما انها ضحيه وليست مجرمه. هذا بالنسبه لقانون 398 عملت ايضا على الغاء الماده 41 من قانون العقوبات التي ايضا تكرس العنف وتشجع الزوج على ضرب الزوجه وقتلها يعني وارتكاب حالات العنف ضدها، الماده 41 تقول لا يعتبر او لا يعتبر فعل ضرب الزوجه لغرض تاديبها فعل يعاقب عليه القانون، 
وهذه ايضا تكريس للعنف ضد المراه ومقنن القانون يعني قنن ووافق على العنف ايضا حاولت ان الغيها لكن هناك اصوات رفضت ورفضت وحاربتني بسبب الغاء هذه الماده قانون الناجيات الأزيديات الحمد لله أنتم تعلمون أن ما تعرضت له الأخوات الأزيديات من سيطرة داعش وارتكابه الاغتصاب والسبي والقتل لأزواجهن وأبنائهن شرعنا قانون هو حماية أو تعويض الناجيات أو إنصاف الناجيات هو قانون الناجيات الأزيديات وخصصنا لهن رواتب وملاذات آمنة ومنح في القانون تمنح وظيفة وتمنح راتبا تقاعديا ولدينا أسس دائرة خاصة بالأخوات الناجيات كذلك معالجة أوضاع الأبناء الذين ولدوا لهؤلاء الأيزيديات من الدواعش شرعنا هذا القانون الحمد لله وكان جهود للجنة المرأة في تشريع هذا القانون كان أعطاهم امتيازات ماديه ومعنويه وصحيه وكذلك شمولهن باعاده التاهيل ودمجهن في المجتمع العراقي مره اخرى وكان للمرجع الديني لهم دور في احترام هؤلاء الازيديات وكونهن ضحيه والان نحن بصدد وصادق رئيس الجمهوريه في عيد المراه على هذا القانون وسيكون قيد التنفيذ بعد نشره بالجريده الرسميه وسنعمل على مراقبة تنفيذ هذا القانون في المرحلة القادمة ونوفر الحياة الكريمة لأخواتنا الأزيديات الناجيات من اقتصابات وجرائم داعش الإرهابي شكرا أكرر شكري جزيل وأتمنى للمرأة في أنحاء العالم دوام التقدم والازدهار ودوام التعاون فيما بيننا لإيصال المرأة إلى مواقع صنع القرار وإلى تعديل القوانين التي تكرس في العنف بما يعمل على إنصاف المرأة في المجتمعات التي تعاني منها من حالات العنف وتعاني من حالات التمييز والتهميش في لدى النساء شكرا جزيلا مرة ثانية وآسفة للإطالة Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad you ended into with talking about monitoring because that's the way that, you know, a lot of these uh, efforts that you're making for going forward will be held to account. And I hope we'll be able to discuss with you more in our uh, question and answer session coming up soon. Um, next, I would like to invite uh, Honorable Liana Chapota from Malawi to join us. Liana, you've got something to tell us about how you've had to work within your political party to achieve your position as a member of parliament. You were elected in 2019. Um, and I think you've got something very interesting to tell us about how you work with political parties and sometimes the own people around you who you think are going to support you. I'll hand over to you, Liana. Thank you so much. As uh, you have already alluded to, I'm Liana Chapota from Malawi. I'm a member of parliament. I was elected into office in 2019. First and foremost, it is an honor today to join fellow women in this panel discussion at this very important event where we're looking at the evidence of the impact of gender on democracy. And uh, today I will discuss, you know, some of the experiences that I've encountered, more especially the barriers which hinder women to go through and occupy uh, public office, more especially through political party process and how I managed to challenge uh, some of these uh, barriers. From my own perspective, the journey to occupy the public office has not been easy for women and I especially because there are always barriers which hinder women to go through and occupy the public uh, office. Just to provide uh, some highlights on the journey, on my journey, first and foremost, the political party systems are the ones which hinder women from contesting on a level playing ground. There is no level playing ground for women. Our political parties have no clear uh, legal frameworks to guide and uh, encourage women to participate in the public office. 
despite having the international protocols which support participation of women, our parties have really failed uh, to adapt them and uh, provide the affirmative action uh, to deliberately support women are uh, willing to context uh, for party public positions. Uh, this is more evident uh, during party uh, primary elections in our context, because we have to go through uh, a political party elections. And uh, this is not easy to access political party structures, which uh, is an electoral college in the primary election. Yeah, so in most cases uh, where the incumbents are, are like males, most of the times uh, women suffer a lot uh, to penetrate through the structures. It needs uh, one to be brave enough uh, to break uh, through those uh, party structures, more especially at constituency level. And uh, it needs one uh, want to be uh, bold enough uh, to do that. But uh, in my own scenario, uh, what I had to do in my constituency, I had to use uh, polit uh, I had to use the traditional leaders. I also had to use the local voters to influence these delegates because uh, it's only a group of people who vote in uh, during the primary election. So I had to. Uh, to uh, to go to convince the local leaders and the constituents so that they would convince these delegates because I said, look, uh, if you want change in this constituency, you have to vote for me. But uh, for me to go through a party ticket, I need to go through primaries of which by then they had not yet opened uh, for a new aspirants to meet the delegates, which uh, it was uh, already a challenge for us to maneuver around to sell ourselves so that uh, these delegates uh, can uh, um, vote for us through uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the primary election. So I had to use these, uh, uh, polit uh, uh, these uh, uh, leaders, these traditional leaders, because I said, look, these delegates are your friends. These delegates are your sons. These delegates are your own people. Why don't you tell them what you want to do at the end of the day? And in so doing, in some other parts of the constituency, it worked for me because these are the, the, the very same people which had to uh, convince the, de the delegates that they have to vote for Liana uh, during the, uh, uh, the, 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 the primary uh, elections. But however, um, if the parties, you know, put up legal framework, a, a specific uh, uh, legal framework uh, for uh, uh, women so that uh, they would be able you know, to be helped or to be supported. I think it can give a high chance for women uh, to, uh, to be in this uh, position. Otherwise, it's really hard to penetrate into uh, these party structures for you to be recognized uh, uh, into uh, uh, a, a public office. And the other barrier which uh, is there is uh, resources. You may agree with me that uh, uh, in most cases, male candidates are well uh, resourced than women. And uh, these male candidates, they use their resources to victimize uh, uh, women candidates in uh, many cases. And I, for one, am a living example where the incumbent had to mobilize young men uh, to uh, to to distract some of my campaign. And I remember on several accounts, I had uh, 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 to be stopped from uh, going to campaigns, to be stopped uh, to, uh, to meet these delegates. But uh, in my own uh, ways, I also had to use my, I, my, 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 my finances also uh, uh, to, to, to hire some other people so that they could uh, uh, have a, my buy-in. So you can actually see that uh, if you don't have money, if there are no resources, it's also difficult to penetrate or uh, to counteract the, 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 the incumbent when it comes to uh, political arena. And uh, much as uh, maybe the issue of resources are there, in my own uh, way, uh, I had to, uh, to go an extra mile where um, I had to do uh, some fundraising to get the money 
uh, to finance my campaign, of which uh, somehow, uh, somewhere, it is not easy for other women to do that. It needs one uh, uh, to be uh, really determined mm -hmm. so that uh, you can raise the funds and help you uh, to get through. Because even these uh, primary elections, you need money to meet delegates, you know, uh, to meet the, these local chiefs. Sometimes they will ask money. So you really need to, to have uh, a good uh, uh, resource uh, envelope for you to uh, penetrate through uh, these uh, political uh, structures. And uh, the other uh, critical issue, which also uh, affects us women is the cultural value. And uh, when uh, the findings were being uh, said, I said, I think these are really, you know, truly reflection on what happens uh, on the ground, because you can actually see that cultural values are also uh, one of the barrier which women we are facing when it comes to uh, uh, to stand in uh, political or to occupy the political uh, or public office. And uh, these um, um, cultural values, you know, more especially uh, uh, in Malawi, it's, uh, it's, it's an issue because uh, most of the times women are regarded as, uh, as less important than uh, men. And you look at uh, this kind of uh, uh, perception is also transferred uh, to political uh, party arenas where there's that belief, there's that norm that women cannot um, uh, be as effective as men. And already that's a setback. And already you cannot have uh, a buy-in in political party arena whereby they already judge you that you are a woman, you cannot uh, deliver, you are not capable uh, to, uh, to be in that public office. But in my own um, capacity, I had to show them that uh, despite being a woman, I can still do it. Uh, I had to also do some other things in my constituency. I had to do uh, several uh, projects before uh, the primary elections, before uh, the, um, the initial uh, elections, because in my case, I was looking beyond primary elections, because I said if I would not get through the primary elections, I would stand as an independent candidate. So I was also looking just beyond uh, uh, primary elections. So I had to, uh, to do some uh, several uh, projects where uh, you know, this had also uh, uh, a buy-in to the constituents where they said, I think she is capable to do something because I, I told them that, you know, this is what I can do. You know, for, for instance, I had to construct a bridge where the incumbent had never, you know, put uh, across uh, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, structure. So to, to, to people, they now became are uh, more convinced and uh, they started also, you know, uh, uh, liking me and um, uh, telling uh, some of the people that I think this is the, the, the right candidate uh, for us uh, uh, to, to, to vote for because Leon. I showed that. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, you're telling us a very interesting story, but we've just one minute left for you, please. Wow, wow, okay, thank you. So uh, through this um, um, uh, predicament, you know, it needs a boldness, it needs one uh, to showcase that um, you are capable of doing things. And um, the other last uh, critical issue is also sexual harassment, which I myself has uh, also gone through. The incumbent being a veteran in the party, he had to use each and every uh, influence to make sure that uh, uh, he tarnished my image. He had to use each and every way um, uh, to demean uh, me as a woman, you know, all those sorts of ways, uh, prostitute and the like. And uh, you can actually see that some of these are demeaning uh, words uh, would uh, uh, be a setback to a woman. But I said, no, this, uh, despite the sentiments, uh, I will stay focused because I wanted to achieve something. So uh, in so doing, that's how uh, I, I tried to maneuver around. I tried to penetrate the party system, but really it's not uh, easy. You really need to be determined. You really need to be brave uh, to penetrate into uh, the, the, the system. So uh, those are some of the experiences which I've shared, but I can also say that uh, being a woman is not something which uh, should be uh, uh, a determinant um, issue to stop us, you know, uh, contesting in the public uh, office is possible. We can do it, and I did it. Thank you so much.
thank you so much, Leanna. And I think you spoke to so much of our findings and particularly that point about, uh, you know, there is desire, but there is a lot in the way and, and bravery gets us there. So thank you so much for sharing that. Sibi Wei, can I turn to you now uh, from South Africa? I think, uh, you know, a nice counterpoint to what Leanna has been saying about, about the things that we might have to face as women in this political space, uh, about how to, to build up our resiliency in the political career and our political life. So I'll turn to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia, and uh, thank you to the other panelists for sharing such insightful findings. Um, as, as, as was introduced before, uh, I'm Sivua Kwakube, I'm a member of parliament and I uh, serve on the health portfolio. And I am the spokesperson for the official opposition in South Africa, the Democratic Alliance. I think perhaps for, for my inputs in, in, the, in the panel discussion there, I would say that there are through three perhaps uh, problem statements that one needs to almost confront. The one is that gender representation as has been proven by various reports across whether it be corporate or political spaces, wherever it is, gender representation still, um, I think as Maria said earlier, still remains the uh, exception and not the rule. Uh, and it's wholly inadequate. And often people use certain tropes to kind of uh, explain what that is. And often it's said that women are not interested in running for public office or women are not resilient enough to remain in public office or they don't necessarily have the stamina or the stomach uh, for, for politics. And I think largely these are excuses that are used to lock women out of various opportunities of in, you know, penetrating the space. Then I think the second problem is that there are many um, very superficial sort of uh, gender parity interventions that are often used. And so diversity became a buzzword uh, a couple of years ago in many parliaments, mainly in many institutions, many political parties saw themselves as, you know, that they, they had this obligation to embrace diversity and bring on women on board. But the big problem with artificial or at least superficial interventions is that they're not substantive enough. And therefore, you may have 50% representation of women on your benches in parliament. But what does that actually mean? Does that move the dial? Does that shift the conversation? Does that change the face of leadership in a meaningful way? And often you will find that many women will sit on the benches of parliament and many of them don't last. Um, and that takes me to my third problem statement is that women are not are often because of the various, as Liana said, uh, of the various um, uh, ob obstacles that they face often either don't last in politics or they are um, confronted with various challenges like was presented earlier in the panel discussion of why women essentially don't last. And so during my time in, in working in politics, and I've been working in politics now for eight, nine years, um, and first as a, as, a, as a professional communicator, and now as a member of parliament, there are five key things I think is are quite crucial um, for resilience in, in politics. And, and this list is by no way exhaustive. I think there are various other things that I'm learning from the other members um, uh, of this panel to, to, to really to, to speak to this issue. The one is, I think what is quite important is one, I think women need to understand that we've got to lead as, as we are. So lead as you are. And by that, I mean, authenticity is very important. There's a very big reason why Maria said this, I think it was um, when she spoke about the fact that, you know, if, you know, if we keep doing the same thing for, and getting solutions from the same people who went to the same universities, who socialize in the same social circles, who come and have life experiences that are all the same, then the solutions are going to be none, you know, none the wiser or not creative, and they're not going to in any way um, provide us meaningful change. And so leading as you are is important, understanding that you bring something to this table, you bring something to this political party, you bring something to that parliament, and therefore you don't need to aspire to, you know, to outman a man, or you don't need to aspire to a certain level of masculinity. The reality is that who you are 
your authenticity is actually your greatest asset as you're walking into that political space and honing that and really finding your voice in yourself is quite important. And then I think the second thing, which has been really a saving grace for me um, in, in politics is investing in one's credibility. And by that, I mean, I think you, you gain a lot of respects and you gain a lot of um, political capital when even your own political party, um, even your own organization will understand that you are credible at what you do. You either hone into a skill, you either hone into a speciality and you have a niche and you find that and you excel in it. And once you start to be excellent in what you do, you become, you don't become disposable or, um, and, and simply replaceable where, you know, we need to find the next woman who's going to be good at this because ultimately you're not just a woman, you're an excellent member of parliament. You're an excellent contributor to the conversation. And so really working hard, becoming excellent takes a lot of work, takes a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of grit. Um, and, and often you probably have to work a little bit harder and a lot harder than your male uh, counterparts. But the reality is that excellence buys you political capital in order for you to be able to have a voice in your party, in order for you to have a voice in your parliament. And that's why it's important to invest in your excellence. The third thing is that I think women and any woman will tell you that there's often this um, notion that women are discovered and that we found you somewhere and we've now brought you on board and somehow you know you now need to be almost grateful um because you know amongst all the women we could have found we found you and so really you know earn your keep you know keep your head down work very hard don't you know shake the status quo don't um you know upset the the the, the party leaders or you know you know, or members of your cabinet, the reality is that no one found you, you earned your space, you earned your space and understanding that and rocking up every single day to work to your portfolio committee to those meetings to your party caucuses, understanding that I earn my keep and I'm excellent. And I was worthy before I came onto this organization. And actually, this organization needs me more than I need it because I'm here with an offering. I'm here offering something which is going to change people's lives ultimately. And so that's why that also has to be linked. And nobody's saying, you know, be arrogant or not be humble, but often humility is used to curtail women's, um, you know, potential, particularly in politics, you know, be humble, don't be shrill, don't be too much. Um, and the reality is that that is often used as a way to, you know, silence you or, or keep you in a particular frame. And so really understand that you've earned your keep before you arrive there. Nobody owns you or owes you or you don't owe anyone for being there and that you have something to offer. And the fourth thing is that I, I really do admire the work that is done by women's caucuses around the world. Um, women's formations, but I do want to say this, and and I and I want to to be, I'm hoping to be understood that it's quite important that women contest main political power in their parties and in their countries. Often, women's caucuses, women's organizations, women's networks are used as a way to sideline women to say contest for power there, become the leader of your women's caucus and not contest for main political power where you lead your own organization, where you lead your country one day. And I want us to be able to use those women's caucuses as support and as great networking opportunities, but they have to have a spillover effect into the main political space where we contest main political power. Because ultimately, if we speak amongst ourselves about legislation that needs to be passed around, um, you know, yeah, gender equality or legislation that needs to be passed around uh, violence against women, it's never going to get anywhere until we get to a point where we are changing policy in our main political parties and we're raising these things in our main parliament. And the last thing, and it may seem uh, very airy-fairy, it may seem as something that is often not emphasized 
in, um, in, in political life. And often it's often weaponized against women, but guarding against one's wellness. The reality is that you can go out there and you can be a warrior, but the reality is that if you're not looking after your wellness, you on you are going to literally burn out at you know sort of at the altar of this bigger service that you are trying to do and so one of the big things that you've also got to do is surround yourself by powerful women um great mentors in many different spaces in different industries that will influence um your ability to do your work very well um surround yourself by experts and people who will be um, influential in your career, but also surround yourself with loved ones and friends who are real and surround yourself with good, um, real ways of looking after yourself, after your health, after your heart um, and after your life. Because ultimately you don't want to sacrifice your life at the altar of public office. Um, because that's why women don't last, because the one, you know, burns out and very few follow afterwards. If we're going to have continuity with leadership with women in these political spaces, then we've got to make sure that we keep it sustainable. We show other women that it's not, we're not going there to die. We're going there to pave a way for more women to follow so that we're not just an exception at the end of the day, but we become the norm. And so for me, those are the main five key um, sort of resilience points, as I said, not an exhaustive list, but um, something that I, I really want to leave with the panel today that I think it are things that we probably need to give some thought to as we go out there and we boss um, in our various spaces and in our various countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sibi Bay. I was writing these down as you were speaking to remind myself afterwards. Thank you. Preet, could I please invite you to join us? Uh, Preet Gill is the Shadow Minister, uh, Shadow Secretary of State for International Development for the UK. Uh, and I invite you to talk about, about your, your pathway to your role. Thank you so much, Sophia. And it's a real pleasure to join this event alongside such impressive speakers. And I'm very honoured to be invited to speak about my own journey into politics and the need to bring more women into formal political leadership and break down the barriers that hold us back. And so much of the research that, it is, it, that is discussed in the Women Political Leaders report really chimes with my lived experience. And it's extremely interesting. And I think for a lot of women, it will be an extremely validating read. It evidences how many of the obstacles that women face in public life are in a sense universal. And it reminds us how much work we all have to do, but that this shared challenge ought to be a basis for solidarity between women and feminists worldwide. One of the lessons I took away from the report was how women are often each other's greatest champions. And th this is why it is such a great pleasure to join this event in such good company. The state of the game for women in UK politics has come a long way in recent years. We elected our second female prime minister in 2017 and the Labour Party achieved parity between the number of women and men that speak for it in Parliament. And we appointed the first ever woman shadow chancellor of the Exchequer and we have seen Westminster rocked by the Me Too scandal and Pestminster, triggering overdue reforms of our working and reporting practices. In all of these achievements, I think we can all recognize these achievements have not been a given, but hard won. I remember my first local Labour Party meetings and feeling quite outnumbered in a stuffy community center dominated by middle-aged men. Many of these men had done outstanding work, sometimes for decades, serving their local communities. But I found myself sidelined from discussions or treated differently as a woman who wanted my voice to be heard. As I became more active, I continued to experience setbacks. In some cases, this took the form of blatant sexism. Once I remember offering my take on one hotly contested debate, only be told, to be told to go home, look after my children, and to not concern myself with any of these issues. As a woman in politics, you have to learn how to pick your battles. And at the time, I chose to ignore that comment and focus on my own path. At other times, the discrimination was less brazen, but no less real. When I first put myself forward for a cabinet position in Samuel Council just after a year of becoming a councillor, I was told in no uncertain terms to stay in my lane, even though the brief was what I had been doing my entire career. 
I remember being called into the leader's office and naively explained why I thought what I had to contribute. And I was told it doesn't quite work like that. You need to wait your turn. There are many in the queue who, are who have been waiting for an opening for many years. And this was a real lesson in how power works, how women are disadvantaged by incumbency when they are not represented and the time it can take for that to change. Women still make up less than a quarter of the representatives in legislatures worldwide. And in the UK, whilst we beat this average, but not enough at 34% of MPs, councils are a similar story. And let's not even start at the House of Lords. It's a source of great pride for my own party that we have led the way on female representation with 51% of our MPs now being women, particularly so given the emphasis that this report puts on the responsibility of political parties to be engines for change. The progress we've made has been long and slow. For the Margaret Bonfields and Barbara Castles who blazed a trail in decades past to the party policies and initiatives that have got us where we are now, many of which are recommended within this report. Some of these, such as our strong stance on all women shortlists and fabulous initiatives like the Joe Cox Women in Leadership Program, I have personally to thank for opening doors to me that might otherwise have been closed or I might never have even thought to try to open. As a society, I think we have come a long way and I'm incredibly proud to have been elected as the first female Sikh MP in the UK, but I'm also frustrated that it took until 2017 for that to happen. Having campaigned in the very same streets and neighborhoods as the world famous Christabel Pankhurst and the formidable Mary MacArthur, I don't underestimate the work that has since gone into making our elected representatives gradually come to look more like the people they serve. And during this past Women's History Month, I think I've been thinking about women's movements protests throughout history and my own heritage in relation to this. The theme of International Women's Day this year, Choose to Challenge, really struck a chord with me as it reminded me of one of my heroes, Sophia Dilip. And I spoke about Sophia in my maiden speech in Parliament. You could say that Sophia was a challenging woman. She was the granddaughter of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the ruler of the Sikh empire from 1801 to 1839 and she's the goddaughter of Queen Victoria. Sophia was a star in the suffragette movement, campaigning for women to have the right to vote in Britain and abroad. Today, her name and picture are on the plinth on the statue of Millicent Fawcett in Parliament Square. The challenge that women like Sophia and the other suffragettes posed to their government of their day has literally changed the world. Whether it was her refusal to pay tax to a state in which she was denied a democratic say, pounding the streets with copies of votes for women in hand, or getting kettled by the police in St. Stephen's Gate alongside Emily Pankhurst at Black Friday in 1910. We all owe something to those women throughout history, like Sophia, who refused to keep their heads down or stay in their box. It reminds us that the forces of reaction aren't new, of the enduring importance of protest and of the power of the idea of women's liberation that was able to unite working class women from mill towns in the north with an Indian princess living in the courts, quarters of Hampton Court Palace. While I'm here predominantly to talk about formal political leadership, we should never forget how many women and girls around the world are displaying informal leadership, leading women's rights organizations which are working tirelessly to overcome deep set gender norms and balance, imbalances. Their fight is our fight. This event is really timely as the coronavirus crisis has provided a stark reminder of the many barriers women have to overcome in order to fully participate in public life. The economic fallout of the pandemic has fallen disproportionately on women in the informal economy. The burden of childcare responsibilities while schools have been closed and the breaking up of support networks while lockdowns have been enforced. Faced with this, it is no wonder why women find it difficult to get on the path to becoming political candidates and is why we end up with shocking disparities where women make up 70% of global health sector workers, but less than a quarter of health ministers worldwide. It was notable when our government encouraged parents to go back to work while neglecting to provide answers on the safe running 
of daycare and nurseries, a decision that had a drastic impact on single parents and mothers who carry the double burden of holding down a day job and domestic care. I can't help but think if more women had been in the room, this oversight might not have happened. And as a mother to two girls, I'm determined to leave a legacy of a more gender equal world for them and to raise them to carry on that torch. Yet having spent most of the last year with my daughters at home, I know how for many women in politics, there is just no escape and no let up in terms of our duties and what we are expected to do, juggling our professional lives, caring for our children, taking on the role as teachers, completing domestic chores. Many of us are still fighting for equality in our own homes. I think as women, we build resilience to keep going because so many others are so dependent on us. Whilst I've been unwell, I might rest for one day, but then suddenly I feel guilty because I think I've got to take care of the kids and I've got to sort out all the other things. We're in this constant vicious cycle of putting high expectations and demands on ourselves. I was buoyed reading this report as it shows us how some of the tools we have to bring more women into the room are readily at our disposal, whether in government or out. As individuals, we can be the role models, the mentors, the support networks for others, and we can support those programs that supported us, like the Joe Cox program, the local government next generation schemes, or newer projects like Parliamentors, which encourages university students to participate. But more than that, it is a reminder of the significant structural barriers that we still need to break down. We all have those experience, and we must all choose to challenge this generation of political leaders to open those doors for the next. That is why this month, I and my colleague Yasmin Kreshi in the Shadow International Development Team have launched Labour's Gender Equality in Development Consultation. We want to engage with members like-minded countries, think tanks, civil society communities, and activists to build a transformative international development policy that takes us towards a more gender equal world. As the Westminster Foundation report so eloquently puts it, women demonstrate political leadership every day even when they are not bestowed with an office or official title. So let's remember to hold on to that activist spirit as we rebuild from the pandemic. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Preet. And that's such a lovely way to round out our conversation. Now, I think we have about five minutes left and my colleague Shannon O'Connell, our director of programs, will just put one question each to the panelists to respond to in about 30 seconds. I'll hand over to Shannon. Thank you, Sophia, uh, very, very much. March is always my favorite month of the year because all that quiet work, all that work that you've all described uh, in your magnificent presentations gets a little bit of light shown on it. Um, and so the descriptions of that hard work, the relentlessness that you all very much described um, get to come out in the light of day and we get to see them and celebrate them. So thank you all very, very much for your beautiful testimonies and exceptional pieces of learning and teaching that you offered for us. Um, we don't have, we could spend a long time talking about this and I would love to, um, but we've only got a few minutes. So what I thought I might do is ask a quick question that links a lot of your presentations. I think unfortunately we've lost Liana to uh, infrastructure issues, but um, I'd really like to link this issue of um, excellence, authenticity, having a place in politics, whether we are told we should be there or not, and not doing politics as a form of self-sacrifice. Saviwa, so you really gave us uh, some good guidance as well that linked into the other speaker's comments about this issue of authenticity. And what we heard from everybody else is the extent to which we are getting messages and young women in particular, women who are not represented are getting messages about not belonging, not being there. One of the things that might be helpful in countering that narrative is helping to build together a catalog of what that excellence is. So what I'd like to ask each of you to do in a short phrase or sentence is to please share with us one characteristic trait or achievement that has been part of your experience in politics that is different from what was there before. What makes up your authenticity? What makes up your excellence? And I'm gonna challenge the way you were each socialized by asking this because women are raised not to talk about themselves. 
but as an act of inspiring other women who are considering politics, please tell me one thing about yourselves that is a strength, um, a part of your excellent, part of your authenticity that would not be part of what's going on if you were not there. And maybe we can start in the order of speakers. So Minna, would you start please as a leading researcher in this area? Well, I thought I'd get away with it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, uh, oh, please, can you ask someone first? That was <laughs> I have one about you. Every bone in my body having to think of something. <laughs> All right, I've got some ideas for you, having worked with you, Minna, about just the, the strength of your intellect and what you bring to this work. But um, I will shift to Maria. Maria, could we hear from you, please? Oh, Shannon, that, um, it's, it's a million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I, I would say that, the well, the reason why I became an MP is I looked at Parliament and didn't see many people like me. And I suppose when I say that, I mean a working mum with then three quite small children and that insight and I guess that resilience of having been a working mom all my life um, was something I felt was unique quite actually more unique than I thought it was because I was only the 65th there were only 65 women in my party elected before me and many of them didn't have children most didn't have small children so I felt that kit brought something very new um, and I probably was right in that much, much more so than I thought. Mm. Thank you, Maria, very much. Intisar, marhabar. ووجدت كم هي كم كانت المرأة العراقية والعربية تعاني من تهميش وظلم وعنف ضدها فأردت أن أغير القوانين نحو حرية وإنسانية المرأة واحترام كرامتها وفعلا دخلت في لجنة المرأة والأسرة والطفولة استفدت من عملي كمحامية وأردت أن أغير القوانين نحو حفاظ على كرامة المرأة وإنسانيتها وأن يكون لديها إرادة مستقلة في اختيار الزوج واختيار حياتها واختيار تعليمها بالتالي وجدت نفسي في البرلمان لأنني المدافعة الحقيقية والأولى عن حقوق المرأة وعن نشاطها ودافعت كثيرا وواجهت كثير من المشاكل في هذا الموضوع سواء مشاكل اجتماعية أو سياسية لكنني صامدة وأحسن أداء عملي في البرلمان من خلال خبراتي لمدة 11 سنة في السياسة وكذلك في المحاماة ودراستي للقانون وأشكر لكم هذا الجهود وكذلك أؤكد على أنه لا يمكن للمرأة أن تكون وحدها أن يجب أن يكون لديها عمل جماعي مع نساء مؤمنات قضية المرأة وقضية إنصاف المرأة ووصولها إلى مواقع صنع القرار شكرا شكرا شنون ممتاز انتصار شكرا شكرا سيفيوي when we turn to you please Thank you. Um, look, I mean, when I was elected to office, I was 30 years old. I could have done many other things, um, but I wanted to go and change what I'd been grown up being socialized on what leadership looks like. Often we were told that leadership is hard, leadership is, you know, is, is, is harsh, um, and that if you're going to lead an organization, if you're going to lead anything, you've got to almost be dispassionate. And I could not agree, disagree more. And so one of the things that I know, two things that I know in my political career that I lead with is great empathy. And I think it makes me an incredible leader because I'm able to place myself in the situation of others. And I think once as policymakers and as lawmakers, we become human first, that makes us good at what we do. And secondly, I mean, I, I, I think just for me as something as simple and as, as mundane as preparation, I, I, I speak about excellence quite a lot because I really do believe that it 
does buy you license to say to people, no, I will not do that. I don't feel comfortable saying that. That does not align with my brand of politics. But you can't have that or you can't do that when your political capital is so low. And your only way you can buy political capital, in my view, as somebody who's not interested in political machinations and you know hustling of power, is essentially being excellent. And the only way to be excellent is to be prepared. And in whatever space you walk into, be prepared. And there's plenty of ways to do that. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you, Sabiwe. Preet, could we turn to you, please? And Minna, you're next. Thank you so much, Shannon. I, I would say it's my background and experience because, of course, I am the first Sikh female MP uh, ever elected. And that puts so much pressure to make sure it doesn't take that long again to, you know, Parliament must reflect the very people it serves. And then I think, you know, having worked at the grassroots in terms of in local government as a social work manager, really understanding that the policies and decision making that takes place in Westminster, how does that actually play out on the ground? What's people's experiences as a result of the decisions that we take? Um, um, and, you know, I, I think it, a lot of people say, you know, parliamentarians are really removed or they are, you know, their backgrounds have been such that, you know, they don't have that connection with the public and they don't always know how to empathise. And I think that really does matter. There isn't many social work uh, professionals that became MPs. There's a few, there's a handful of them. And I think it's so important that, you know, a lot of the kind of skills and the knowledge base that I come with, when I look at the casework that we do as parliamentarians, it's really very similar to, to doing social work because it's so diverse. Um, and it just, it just, you know, lots of people sort of say it's really good that you had a real job previously before you became an MP because, of course, they have this view that suddenly we just do not know what it's like because of the lack of empathy. So, I, so yes, yeah, so definitely my background and my experience. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you, Preet, very much. Minna. Okay. <laughs> well, I was thinking, um, I, I had four, four brothers and when I was growing up, I... I fairness was a very, very big thing. And I think that's what brought me to this whole sort of feminist line of thinking. Um, and I couldn't shout the loudest and I couldn't beat them up if things were unfair. So I, I was quietly gathering the evidence, <laughs> which I think is what I've continued to do. And, I, and if you can build it, you see, you find out what's unfair and you find out all the evidence and I've sort of been placing it together. And I think that's why I really enjoy working in these kinds of reports and this kind of work. Because I think it's sort of building on <laughs> from my childhood, this sort of angle of when things, when things are unfair and something is obviously wrong, I mean, I'm the sort of person who wants to go back to the evidence, go back to what's going on and just slowly mount my, <laughs> slowly mount my case. But yeah, that's, that's my sort of little contribution. Thanks. Fantastic. <laughs> Sophia, I will hand it over to you to close before we get shut down by um, CSW and you can give us your characteristic as well on the way out the door. Well, I think my characteristic must be excellent timekeeping um, and that serves in all, all ways in life. Um, and with that, I want to say a very, very big thank you to all our wonderful panelists for your testimonies, your honesty, your bravery, uh, and for paving the way for all of us as we look to inspire ourselves, but all the women around us to be formally recognized for their informal political leadership every day. Um, and with that, um, we're at the hands of the CSW platform. Uh, and so we'll, we'll wish everyone well and look forward to continuing our conversations with everyday life. And also, of course, on Twitter. <laughs> so please, uh, we'll see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Shukran Intisar. Thank you. Bye-bye.